Well, wonderful. I am Antoine So, <laughs> and uh, uh, we are very sorry that you are not here. Uh, yes. But anyway, we are very thankful that you uh, have agreed to have this uh, conference. So, we have all read your paper, and uh, we will uh, ask you if you could, uh, first of all, summarize in five minutes the main question, I would say, is arising here, also uh, it, um, regarding your paper, is where would you place in the brain quantum phenomena? Mm. Well, where in the brain would you locate quantum phenomena? Or quantum I would, randomness? I would think that there are plenty of uh, Occasions. For instance, you could imagine that um, the ion channels which produce the uh, membrane noise in part um, require a quantum consideration in their actions. But I mean, that is not my field. You have to um, you have to realize that I'm not a physicist, despite the name. <laughs> I'm a biologist, <laughs> and uh, so. Um, where in the brain we could have uh, these special quantum phenomena uh, which uh, make uh, physics so uh, interesting, um, I don't know, but um, of course quantum mechanics uh, must apply to the brain. I mean, the brain uh, works on physical principles, so we have no reason to believe that uh, quantum mechanics is not fully um, acting in the brain, right. I mean, as the basis of the brain. Yeah. You, you have uh, referred to ion channels. Uh, is there some work uh, uh, going on on these uh, ion channels, trying to relate this with quantum uh, phenomena? Yeah, I, uh, I mean, there are um, explicit attempts to describe the ion transport through the channels of membranes by um, quantum mechanical um, treatment. And uh, the problem, as far as I was told, is that uh, if you don't uh, do that, if you just use uh, mechanical models, the time for the uh, transport of an ion through the membrane will come out um, by several orders of magnitude different from what one can measure it takes. So uh, the, uh, the suspicion is that one has to apply uh, explicit quantum mechanical uh, calculations to uh, account for the real processes in the membranes. Okay. Uh, still one question. Uh, you uh, have written an article in Nature. Is yes. uh, free will an illusion? Yes. Which is your, the ans your answer to this question? Well, I think um, if in the 18th century the people had said uh, temperature is an illusion because uh, thermodynamics had not been developed in physics yet, people would have uh, not taken these people serious, right? So just because um, some natural science can't account for, account for something, well, one is not entitled to say this is an illusion. So I think from the very basic principles of what physics and what natural sciences can do for us, uh, this is the wrong approach. And um, I think um, it is, of course, not new uh, that um, the natural sciences have difficulties accommodating freedom, but uh, already uh, Kant felt that, and uh, Kant's answer was not that um, freedom is an illusion. Okay, and this is your answer on the basis of your experimental work in biology. Yes, of course, my uh, whole um, my coming to that problem was um, uh, observing flies. I had not intended to uh, open my mouth about philosophy. Uh, we just were 
we just were watching flies and it, uh, and it occurred to us that flies are the originators of their behavior. And we were so struck by that observation because what you heard in uh, the lectures and in the um, education of um, behavioral science was that uh, activity, behavioral activity already was an illusion and in reality it was always reactivity. And that goes back for uh, many decades, back to the second last century, that people have denied uh, real activity. And that, is, uh, that really surprised me because um, language already made such a strong point in distinguishing between the active and the passive. And that uh, and active we always understand as something which I then have called initiating activity, something which originates in the animal. So that prompted us to believe that um, this property of an organism being the originator of his or her behavior goes back very far in evolution. Thank you. I give the word now to the other people in the audience. There is here some physicists that uh, obviously uh, know very well your father's uncertainty <laughs> principle. <laughs> and, uh, also, please, you can, uh, everyone can ask a question. Hello, Martin. I'm so very happy to have seen your essay in Nature and uh, was pleased to write you that you had an idea that things happen in two stages, separating the randomness from the decision making. So from, and that was uh, an idea that goes back to William James and uh, about 10 other thinkers, scientists and philosophers, of whom uh, three are in this room today. We have with us uh, Robert Kane, we have Alfred Mealy, <coughs> And I'm happy to say that I'm sitting in uh, Daniel Dennett's seminar this fall on free will at Tufts University back in Massachusetts. So I'm hoping uh, my talk here will be tomorrow uh, about the idea that it happens first with randomness, later with lawfulness. And so maybe you could speak to how you describe this in your Nature article, that it happens in two steps. Yeah, I was, of course, very pleased and delighted about your response. Thank you very much. I was uh, very interested in uh, your account of um, previous explanations in that, uh, in a similar direction. And uh, I think it will certainly be very important for the behavioral sciences uh, to realize um, how this, as you describe it, this two-stage model really works in the brain. <coughs> and um, I guess we have to get a much better understanding what the basic operating mode of brains are. We can describe it in a way which is very uh, partialistic. I mean, it's uh, very uh, rough still, saying that uh, that uh, brain has to all the time update the outcome expectations for its behavioral repertoire. So what we think is that um, there is a behavioral repertoire, behavioral options, which of course in humans is near infinitely large, I mean very, very large, but already in small animals is, is quite considerable. Mm -hmm. And the task of the brain is to um, always update the conse possible consequences of these behavioral options and then to find uh, the most benign or, or most promising behavioral option and realize that and then that turn that into behavior. So that is very similar to uh, your two-stage um, model you uh, proposed and uh, I must say we just, barely, we just don't know how this is realized in brains and from this very crude description I just gave you, you see that uh, immediately that uh, the understanding of how brains work is still uh, lacking profoundly. Thank you.
Okay. So, Nicolas Gisin from the University of Geneva. Uh, there's an op uh, an, uh, a comment that comes quite often when one speaks about quantum events in the brain, namely that the brain is uh, warm and hot and uh, doesn't really look like a quantum optics lab. <laughs> um, so how do you respond to, to these uh, kind of objections? Well, I think what if you ask which type of chance do we need in the brain, I have uh, two answers. We need the objective chance, which is provided, as far as I can understand it, um, by the arguments of uh, quantum mechanics. We need that just to counter the view of total determinism. So uh, if somebody questions freedom on the basis of determinism, then we have quantum mechanics and the answer there is uh, objective chance. If we go to the brain, most of the things where I see that chance is needed, and that is in many places, I would uh, be uh, able to do it with uh, conventional chance, which I call the light, light chance. But um, we don't know how it is made, and we have uh, much too little understanding of the brain to know uh, how important uh, true chance is. My understanding is that the light chance always tends to be bad chance, to be influenced by a certain uh, systematic processes, and then the chance is not as good as it might be and, and should be. So we'll see. I would not be surprised if um, quite a bit of real objective chance is occurring in the brain. But my, the point I really want to make is, once we agree that there is chance in the world, what I would like to emphasize most for the question of the possibility of freedom in behavior is the self. The self that is which has to be made responsible for what it does, and only the self can find in this space of uh, behavioral options that option which is the best uh, for its uh, future. So it is very important to realize that behavior has to be organized in such a way that it is, uh, that it is originated, that it is uh, generated by that very organism. And I think that is what uh, the discussion of freedom is all about, that we should not be determined by others or by circumstance or by drugs or whatever, it, we have to be ourselves to generate our behavior. And you, uh, Andrew, and then we'll go. So I'm uh, Andrew Briggs from Oxford University. Uh, and I was wondering what kind of experimental evidence do you think would persuade everyone to make the transition from speculations that quantum effects might be relevant in the brain to them being, uh, you know, empirically established beyond doubt. Well, that's a very interesting question. I have no good um, answer to, uh, I mean, if I would know an experiment to prove that we need objective chance rather than uh, light chance, um, uh, then I would of course try to do that experiment with my flies. <laughs> we uh, have very nice experiments to show that we do need chance. I mean that is uh, that is um, comes out in many of our experiments that um, the chance is required to organize behavior, and I think that is what uh, should be really brought across in this discussion, recent discussion about freedom, that chance, of course, if you take it bluntly as, as a cause, uh, as, as an event which triggers behavior, 
is terrible. I mean, any behavior of that sort would be highly pathological. But there are so many examples now in biology where one can see immediately that chance is organized in an organizational principle, that order comes out of this interaction of chance and lawfulness. And I think that should also be realized in the discussion of, um, of freedom in behavior. Can, can I make the, 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 the other side, there's, there's the behavioral pull that you need chance in order to explain the observed behavior. But can there be also a quantum push? In other words, where would you look to find quantum processes in the brain or in living things where you say, look, there are quantum processes going on there that must be introducing that kind of randomness? I mean, uh, uh, we discussed that uh, 10 minutes ago. If it is true that we have quantum processes in the pores of the ion channels, then the quantum uh, randomness might well be um, involved in setting up the membrane noise. And the membrane noise, by all likelihood, is the kind of, uh, of randomness which we need to have a spectrum of behavioral options tried out in the brain before one of it is realized. And so I would say there's a good chance that in investigating uh, what role quantum processes play in ion channels, we will uh, end up concluding that the membrane noise is already in part quantum mechanical noise. I would like to uh, complete some what you are uh, uh, telling us in the sense that there is quite well established research on the way ion channels can regulate motor behavior. For instance, yes, yes. yes. That is, it would be the link then. We would yes, come. Absolutely. Oh, yes. Okay. Wilkos, please. Um, Russell Wilcox, University of Navarra. Um, is it sufficient for an organism? Um, to generate a, um, a chance a chance event even if that chance event is constrained by physical laws is that sufficient to amount to its being free? Well I think it is necessary <laughs> to broaden uh, the space of behavioral options and um, as Paul pointed out um, we have then a deterministic process of choosing uh, the best option of uh, the options pre present okay. but um, we um, all depend upon new options coming up and new options cannot uh, come up by chance and often um, that new option which came up by chance will uh, save us and, and I think that is a typical example where um, uh, this element of freedom comes in and determines our behavior. But do you, do you think that, um, I mean I suppose this links also to the, to the difference between humans and and animals, if there's a qualitative difference, or if it's if it's um, uh, simply a question of the same mechanisms at a more complex level, um, do you think that? I mean, is there not? Don't we mean something more when we talk about freedom than merely even a very complex interplay of of um, <coughs> law governed regularities and and random events? I think there are certainly lots and uh, I mean many different levels um, which have to be discussed. I offered one in my article and I can just briefly summarize, which I think is a very important um, second level of discussion, namely that um, one of the main threats of so social organisms is that the cooperation in the group 
prevents you to um, do your own behavior. Because in, imagine an ant colony, um, the pheromone from the queen will uh, just induce you to do uh, a certain thing, or um, you follow the tray pheromone and so on. So uh, normally, the less advanced societies follow by instruction. And um, so even in the, the pre-hominid societies, it was probably um, the, um, uh, the, relation, the relation of the members in the group which determined that the um, cooperation was determined by what the alpha uh, animal uh, dictated. And I think the human way to cooperate by shared intentionality is uh, an, one of the most central um, inventions which probably led to human language and human societies and human culture. And this is where we meet uh, all the discussion uh, about freedom nowadays. So I think that is a, certainly a different level from what we can describe in flights. And if, uh, if freedom in behavior is something entirely natural, um, why uh, talk about it, right? I mean, yes, it becomes questionable in the human society where we want to have cooperation based on shared intentionality. Okay. Uh, other questions? Jean-Claude, philosopher of science from Paris. Uh, just a small question. There's a model who was developed by a German quantum physicist, Frederick Beck, and the famous uh, neurologist, Sir John Eccles, about how it's possible, in theory, in theory of course, it's just a possibility, uh, for the self to act on the brain. And I want to know if this sort of model can play a role in your vision about free will, about how free will is possible, this sort of uh, interaction between the self and the brain the, in the model developed by Eccles or Beck, or if you prefer model developed by uh, people like Penrose or Stuart Hameroff and Roger Penrose? <coughs> or have you, have you, I know you are not a physicist, but you are in the interface uh, between biology and physics, and so there's different models. There's another by Henri Stapp and um, Mario Beauregard. So all models include one physicist and one neuroscientist. <laughs> and it's why I want to know if uh, one of these models uh, you think are more relevant for the question of free will, or, uh, or it's uh, both equal, or uh, what you think about it? these sort of models? Um, I mean, that uh, you, in the case of Eccles, you refer probably to uh, this idea of, uh, of yes. Descartian uh, dualism, where um, the mental interferes with the physical at a certain site in the brain. And uh, I was totally appalled by that idea. I thought that was <laughs> <laughs> that was totally useless, and I couldn't uh, I couldn't uh, get anywhere with that. Um, and with Penrose's ideas, I again I think, as I said before, and of course we all assume that quantum mechanics uh, applies in the brain, but whether we need some of these. Uh, um, special quantum mechanical effects like superconductivity and at, at very low temperatures, um, something like that. Um, I think there are no indications so far that uh, such phenomena, uh, some of these very special phenomena exist in the brain. And uh, if it were, I would certainly be highly interested to learn about that, and one can at the present stage certainly not exclude that these uh, phenomena play a role. I don't think personally that they will lead to an explanation of consciousness. I think with consciousness our main problem is that we um, have very divergent definitions of what we mean by it. Jim and uh, Sarah. So my, my, my understanding of uh, Penrose's theories is, is that um, uh, some, uh, act some quantum computation would take place in the brain, uh, which would require 
uh, highly isolated uh, quantum systems to enter into a massive superposition, uh, something that we can't even quite do in a laboratory uh, with, uh, e even by, by using very cold temperatures. Um, so to think that, that such activity, such quantum compute, computation activity takes place in the brain uh, is not impossible, but mm, I would be somewhat dubious. Whereas if I understand your theories, well, you, you need quantum mechanics just to produce random bits. Uh, and, and then those random bits once obtained can be processed classically. So the way that you use randomness in the brain to, to decide whether to do something or not, lawfulness and that kind of stuff, uh, that's, that's all a purely classical computation, which is fed by true randomness, which itself is produced <coughs> by, by quantum mechanics. And therefore, uh, to come back to Nicola's question earlier, uh, in order to obtain this quantum phenomenon in the brain, you don't need, to, you don't need, to, you don't need it to be <coughs> super cooled. Uh, all you need is, is very simple uh, quantum phenomena uh, in, in which a binary decision is taken uh, randomly by quantum mechanics. And that can be done at room temperature or at brain temperature. So that as long as you only produce random bits by quantum mechanics and then process it classically, it's, it's, much, more, uh, e it's much easier to believe. Is, is that your view? Um, no, I mean, my, <laughs> I, I didn't quite understand all what you said, so what I can just um, say from what I understood is um, that um, the quantum mechanical chance event, for my taste, is just a necessary ingredient, not only in the brain, but everywhere. I mean, that uh, it describes so much better how we um, experience the world altogether that I find it um, uh, quite strange that uh, we first um, try to eliminate that and then make complicated language-wise and other constructs to explain uh, why we don't uh, talk about it um, properly. So I think to have the, the, the notion that something can start anew, that if the tile from the roof falls down, this is because some uh, initiating event happened in that uh, uh, tile, and that's why it fell down in that moment where it then hit the professor's head who walked down the road. <laughs> I think that is uh, such, um, I mean, only those converging chains of causation, I think that is certainly oca uh, occasionally true, but I, I think the much better description of reality is uh, that indeed occasionally creation is going on, occasionally things happen without sufficient causes, mm -hmm. and uh, this is how we experience the world, occasionally. <coughs> And um, this is what we experience in the brain. And in the brain, of course, where we know from ourselves that something is continuously uh, going on in our brain, we know that activity um, plays uh, an enormous role. Okay. So I'm much more modest with respect to um, how we can at the moment really assign any mechanisms of the brain uh, to quantum mechanical um, effects. Sara? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Sara Gonzalez from the University of Geneva. My question goes into your field, actually. Uh, I think that uh, one of the capabilities of I can't, Sorry, I cannot understand. Uh, could, could you start over? Yes, OK. Sorry. No, no problem. One of the capabilities of uh, adaptive living systems is actually the capacity to anticipate the sensory consequence of actions, uh, as you said in your paper. In, the, in evolutionary terms, which is the change we should expect from the lower species to the higher, to the more evolved species, I mean, should we have more neurons showing capacities to anticipate, to, to make predictions about sensory consequence? Or rather, should we expect to have more, more domains 
in which these capacities are shown. Mm -hmm. The problem is that for me, for my practical application, I would like to know the answer to this question to try to quantify and measure intelli intelligence or at least the capacity for adaptation in individuals. So in which direction should we sh search for this answer? That's a very good question, but I'm not, uh, I don't think I have an um, interesting answer to that. I think um, certainly uh, in higher organisms there is no uh, larger depth in foreseeing the possible consequences uh, of our actions. Of course, this is, um, uh, I think we are so it's still surprised to see something of that at all in uh, small brains like those of insects. So clearly that has made an enormous development, especially with the uh, advent of language. And I mean, this has an enormous step of uh, an improvement, of course. And yet, if we believe that uh, freedom is part of nature, then it has to have started uh, some, uh, at least to be prepared for in evolution. It has not just come out um, suddenly. So I would uh, not hesitate to acknowledge, of course, that there, there are enormous steps of improvement and uh, making this richer and wider and, of course, we can all and tell many things which we will not expect to find in uh, little flies, yet something like freedom has to have a quality um, in behavior which goes back to the origins of behavior. Otherwise, it would not uh, be part of our natural world. <coughs> we will finish, but before finish, I would like to ask you a question often arises when I discuss your article in Nature with the students. The question is whether your love, your love for uh, indeterminism and randomness is somewhat genetically predetermined. <laughs> <laughs> I leave that answer to your students. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Martin. We thank you very much for having agreed to this conference. And we hope very much that for the next meeting, you are among us. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. I'm sorry that I couldn't come. Okay. And I'm sorry that I missed all these interesting uh, presentations and discussions. And uh, good luck for the rest of the conference. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.